History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 27th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And tonight we're talking about the Barren Hill Tavern and Brewery. And Denise, can I give a little rant here? Sure. Well, let me ask you this question first, and I'll ask this of our audience as well. And since we can't hear you, you'll just have to answer this to yourself. But if you lived in a home or you owned a business that was in an older building, wouldn't you want to know the history about that place? Oh, absolutely. And if you knew the history about that place, wouldn't you want to make sure that other people knew about that history as well? Yes, like so many people do at restaurants. They'll have the history of their location on the placemats or whatever. Exactly. That's how we find out about a lot of these locations is from the actual website that's the official website of these haunted locations. And a lot of them like to play up the whole haunted aspect as well. So you can get lots of information on both their history and the hauntings at just that one website. It's a fabulous thing. Until you come to the Baron Hill Tavern and Brewery, and you go to their official website, and you would not even know that the building that they are housed in is nearly 300 years old, because there's not one ounce of history on that website. When you go to the About Us, it tells you all about the brewmaster and the woman who owns the building, but nothing about the actual building. And there is a rich history here. This is a travesty as far as I'm concerned. I can't believe it. At least they've saved the building. So I will give them that. But if it was not for the Wayback Machine, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically a place where internet pages are cached from years and years and years ago, I would have had a hell of a time finding information on this location. You want to hear something really funny too? I should tell everybody as we're recording this show... I'm going to take down that fourth wall that they tell you never to take down in broadcasting. Denise has been away for the past, what, since Wednesday? Five days, yeah. About five days. She just flew in this morning. I picked her up at the airport at 5 a.m. And she was flying all through the night. So as I'm sitting here ranting about the fact that this (laughs) Barren Hill Tavern and Brewery doesn't have anything about their history or hauntings on their actual website. And I had to go through the Wayback Machine and manage to find the old cached pages from the previous location. I'm watching Denise tip forward with her eyes closed and almost hitting the microphone. So everybody, (laughs) I I need everybody to help me. On the count of three, you all need to scream boo and we'll wake her up. Okay. One, two, three. Boo! I was just blinking really long. (laughs) (laughs) I was sitting here going, she's going to hit the microphone. She's going, (laughs) folks. She's going. (laughs) So anyway, if any of you have the opportunity to live in a historic home or own a historic building, make sure you let people know about the history because it is a fabulous thing. And that's my little rant about that. Okay, rant over. I'm awake. Let's roll. (laughs) Like if you'd shut up already. We want to make sure that you check out our website at historygoesbump.com. It'll tell you everything you want to know about the show, where you can find us on social media, listen to the show, how you could donate to the show, subscribe to the newsletter, all that great stuff. And if you want to write us and maybe let us know what you think about the show or give us ideas for future broadcasts, where can they do that, Denise? They can write us at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And as always, we would appreciate your reviews at Stitcher or iTunes if you get the show from either one of those locations. We greatly appreciate those. Yes, we do. Are you ready? Let's get the show going before you fall asleep. That sounds like a fabulous idea. like to support the show please visit our patreon page at patreon.com forward slash history goes bump or perhaps you just want to make a one-time donation click the donate button on our website at historygoesbump.com welcome to this moment in oddity history 
industry. In the remote areas of the swamp and the Everglades in Florida lives a variation of the creature commonly called Sasquatch or Bigfoot. This hominid cryptid variation is known as the skunk ape. And yes, it did acquire that name based on its repulsive stench that some claim is a cross between garbage and skunk spray. The skunk ape is hypothesized to live in caves that are dank, which may be the cause of the stench. Supposed sightings of this elusive creature detail a seven-foot upright walking beast completely covered in long black or reddish hair. The eyes of the creature reportedly glow red. Sightings of the skunk ape began in the 1960s and continue to this day with the most recent highly reported pictures being taken in 2000 by an anonymous woman who sent the pictures to the Sarasota Sheriff's Department in Florida. The National Park Service claims that any such sightings are hoaxes, but indigenous tribes that live in the area where the skunk ape has been seen claim that the cryptids are real. Does the skunk ape actually exist? If it does, it certainly is a mysterious and odd creature. Turn out the lights. The party's just getting started. This Day in History On this day, February 11th, in 1907, the passenger ship Larchmont sinks off of Block Island in Rhode Island. The Larchmont had left Providence at 7 o'clock. The ship was on course with smooth sailing and no signs of trouble. Around 10.45 p.m., that all changed when a schooner that was out of control of her crew approached the Larchmont. A siren of warning was sounded. The Larchmont tried to pull away, but it was too late. The schooner slammed into the port side of the Larchmont before falling away and disappearing. The Larchmont began to take on water rapidly. Everyone was ordered to abandon ship, and the lifeboats headed for Block Island. Captain McVeigh wrote about the experience, quote, The cold was terrible. We struggled for hours and hours, and the pain from our frostbitten hands and feet was almost unbearable. One of our men, a seaman, became crazed and committed suicide in the boat by cutting his throat. No one in the boat had strength enough to prevent him from doing it. We arrived here at 6.30 o'clock in the morning, very much exhausted and frozen, end quote. The captain of the schooner blamed the Larchmont for the accident. He claimed the steamship came towards them and seemed to not see the schooner's lights. By the time the captain realized that the Larchmont was not going to steer away, it was too late. The schooner sank as well. Nearly all the inhabitants of Block Island joined the efforts to rescue victims and recover bodies the next morning. A survivor from the Larchmont claimed the captain and crew abandoned the passengers. Only 19 people aboard the Larchmont survived of 169 passengers. So it would seem that the old adage that the captain goes down with the ship was not true here, and that perhaps the crew really did save themselves. In the end, 150 people lost their lives. History Goes Bump Podcast. Barren Hill Tavern and Brewery has only been open for a couple of years, but the history behind the building that the Swarm Eatery is housed within has an extensive history. Some people who come to this establishment that is located on the outskirts of Philadelphia near the Barren Hill Battlefield get more than just a nice meal and a chance to sample an originally crafted beer. Some of them have had an experience with the unseen. The former General Lafayette Inn might still be playing host to guests that decided to never leave. Barren Hill Tavern is located in Lafayette Hill, Pennsylvania. The town was named for French General Marquis de Lafayette, who spent time in the area during the American Revolution. Lafayette was a French aristocrat who fought with the rebels during the American Revolution, and he was a close friend of several of the founding fathers. Lafayette had been commissioned as an officer at the tender age of, can you believe this, Denise, 13 years old. Wow. In his home country of France. He came to America and was commissioned as a general when he was just 19. That's incredible. (laughs) Just amazing. He would be wounded at the Battle of Brandywine and play a major role in the siege of Yorktown. In May of 1778, 
General George Washington sent General Lafayette to Barron Hill with 2,200 men to do some spying. This seems like a large group for reconnaissance, and indeed, the British soon found out about the group and surrounded them on three sides. Lafayette's force was nearly one-third of General Washington's army, and thus they could not afford to be slaughtered. General Lafayette climbed the tower of the St. Peter's Church, which was right next to the inn, and he mapped out a plan for escape. The British far outnumbered Lafayette, and he ordered a retreat. He knew in order to put up a better fight and succeed in retreating, he needed to convince the British that they were dealing with a bigger force than what Lafayette actually had. He ordered his men to spread out on the future Lafayette Hill and fired sporadically from different spots. The group then backed away through the sunken road where they were not easily seen and they made it across to Maston's Ford safely. The British headed for New York and General Lafayette came up from the rear successfully attacking the British in New Jersey. It's amazing what he did here because they were outnumbered, I believe, four to one is what I'd heard. Wow. And the British knew that they didn't have a very big group, but they were getting fired upon by so many different directions that they weren't sure. Maybe there's more out here than we think. I'm sure the British weren't very happy when they found out how small Lafayette's group actually was. Well, and of course, this is when the rebels, the Americans, figured out, hey, you know, the way the British Redcoats fight is stupid. They stand in lines and just fire, and then the next line does it. And they just stand there and fire like a bunch of idiots. You're a lot smarter to hide behind a tree and maybe shoot from there. So I bet that they were doing some of that as well. Mm. The original building that would later house inns, restaurants, and breweries was built in 1732. In 1752, and everybody, you might want to take notes during this because this building has gone through so many hands, it's hard to keep track. In 1752, Christopher Rapin bought the property and named it the Three Tons Inn, and that's Tons, T-U-N-S. General William Smallwood and General William Hull are believed to have used the Three Tons as their headquarters during the Revolutionary War. See, Denise, if you owned this place, wouldn't you want people to know that? Oh, absolutely, especially with how fascinated people are about, like, war sites and things like that. Exactly. I just, I don't know. If the owners listen to this, I don't mean to be mean about it, but golly, put your history up. They joined General Lafayette and spy operations on the British before the Battle of Barren Hill. After the Revolutionary War, the inn needed extensive repairs, and it was expanded. Fireplaces were added to the first and second floors in corner spaces, which was unique for the time. Marble from the old blue quarry was used to make the mantles. Ludwig Dagger owned the inn during those renovations, and the property was kept in the Dagger family until 1825, when John Hagee took over the inn and renamed it Trooper. In 1828, the property went back to the Dagger family until 1869. George and Leonard Fisher brought the property and changed the name yet again to the Barren Hill Hotel. In 1874, a horse-drawn trolley line was built from Philadelphia, and the hotel saw a resurgence in business. It was at this same time that the property found itself in the hands of another owner. James Mewenny kept the building until 1895, Lottie Gundlach owned the hotel until 1946. It's amazing how many different people, and they all would change the name, too. It's just amazing. Ludwig Zakiewicz, Zakiewicz? Sure. We're going to call him Zakiewicz, <laughs> bought the hotel in 1946 and changed the name to Lafayette Hotel, naming it for General Lafayette. The hotel faced demolition in 1958 to make way for a gas station, You know how I love how they tear down historic buildings to make ways for parking lots and gas stations. Yeah, because as much as we love Wawa, it doesn't need to be in a historic site. No. Although I need to try one of their chocolate malts. I've heard they're awesome. Still haven't gotten one of those yet. Anyway, Ludwig managed to save it. He sold the building to Todd Helmetag and convinced him that restoration would be a plus and that if he made improvements, the hotel would thrive. Ludwig was right, and the Lafayette did very well for the next 30 years. From 1961 until the 1990s, the Mustin family held the property. Mike McGlynn brought the property in the early 1990s. McGlynn believed strongly in preservation, and he began extensive restoration on the building. By 1996, the old building was ready for business again, this time under the name the General Lafayette Inn. It was at this time that the microbrewery was added. In 1999, a bed and breakfast was added. Because of his love for the history, McGlynn began hosting events to commemorate General Lafayette's escape and the local soldier return from the Battle of Germantown. McGlynn died of cancer in 2003. 
Then's brewmaster, Chris Leonard, took over ownership in 2004. The place was never the same, though. The General Lafayette Inn went into bankruptcy and closed in 2010. And unfortunately, when they did that, they killed all evidence that this place ever existed, it seems like. That's why I had to go to the Wayback Machine, because this is the location that's the most well-known. And trying to find anything about the General Lafayette Inn, they killed the website, so everything that had been on it was gone. Erin Wallace is a restauranteur who is unique in the world of brewery ownership since she is female. Besides owning Barron Hill Tavern, she also owns Devil's Den in South Philadelphia and Old Eagle Tavern in Maniunk. And I'm sure for people who live in Pennsylvania, I said that wrong. She bought the former General Lafayette Inn in 2013. She poured $1.5 million into renovations before opening the Barron Hill Tavern and Brewery. And that is what this historic inn and restaurant is today. With such a vast history, and with the location in the heart of some of the American Revolution battles, it is not surprising to hear rumors of hauntings taking place at the building. An older woman is one of the most prominent ghosts rumored to be at the building. When the location was still the General Lafayette Inn, an older woman's full-body apparition would be seen walking in the smaller upstairs dining rooms. She also communicated with investigators via Ouija boards. There are claims that a woman was killed in the building, but we found nothing to su- substantiate that. And any of the claims that I did see about that, it was she was a younger woman, and they said that she'd been murdered, they think, on the second floor, but again... I found no newspapers about it or anything. So for all I know, it's just a rumor or a psychic came in and said, hey, I feel a woman here who says she's young and was murdered. You know, you just have to take that stuff with a grain of salt, I guess. One night after closing, two waitresses were organizing the chairs and they came upon a chair that would not budge no matter how hard they tried. They both felt as though someone unseen were sitting in the chair. They asked a manager for help, and he lifted it quite easily, as though whoever had been sitting in the chair had gotten up. On another occasion, a chair was witnessed tipping up on one leg and twirling in the pool room. That'd be a little creepy. (laughs) Yes, it would. (laughs) Doors have slammed, and their knobs have rattled. Former owner Mike McGlynn claimed that when he would be in his office doing paperwork with the door closed, he would hear the doorknob jiggle as if someone were trying to come in. But when he would look at the knob, it would not be moving. No one would be at the door when he opened it. Disembodied footsteps can be heard throughout the building. Full-bodied apparitions have been seen. In 2007, a bar patron was leaving the tavern around 1 a.m., and he claimed to see the apparition of an old hunched-over man wearing a white nightshirt moving from the host stand towards the kitchen. A bartender did not see the spirit, but he did see the patron's face and how white his face became. A former brewmaster named Russ Kazatka tells the following experience. Quote, I've had a couple of experiences, but just hearing things. I was here one morning, early, by myself. Actually, there was one person in the kitchen, and I'd gone up into the attic to get some stuff for a beer festival. When you come out of the attic, there's a swinging door and a long hallway before you come down the back kitchen steps. I came out of the door and down the hallway. And when I made a turn to come down the steps, I heard someone walking behind me. I stopped, went back to look in the hallway, and there was nobody there, end quote. At the time, only Russ and one other employee were in the building. Paranormal investigators had been allowed to investigate the building when it was the General Lafayette Inn, and many groups claimed that they captured orbs on film, had weird feelings in the building, and experienced battery drains on their equipment. As far as we know, no investigations have been made in the building recently, and the new owner seems indifferent to talk of ghostly experiences. The Barren Hill Tavern slipped through the hands of many owners in its nearly 280 years of existence. Are some of these owners still hanging around the property? Are there ghosts hanging out with the patrons and employees at the tavern? Is this place haunted? That is for you to decide. Now, when I was reading about this place on... Yelp, I believe it was. It's pretty hit or miss. It's about 50-50 with food and service. Mostly, it seems like people are not real happy with the service. So normally, I would say, I want to check out this place, maybe go eat there or something. It's definitely cool to look at it from the outside. And maybe if they were having a special event, I don't know if this is a place that we really would go to eat at, just because I haven't heard the best about the food and everything like that. And since they apparently don't care about their history and hauntings, I don't know. 
I kind of that that uh, biases me a little bit against it. <laughs> But of course, as often as it changes hands, maybe if we wait a couple of years, it'll be under new owners and it'll be awesome. Now, you were in Palm Springs. Was there anything haunted out there? I didn't have a chance to really go and look at things. And so, because I was just walking back and forth to the convention center. So, you didn't see any old, rich, snooty, dead people? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> what was disgusting? It was warmer than it was here in Florida. Mm-hmm. It was beautiful. Beautiful. Now, this show has been a little bit shorter than most of ours. There wasn't a whole lot of information. Again, as I said, I had to do a lot of digging even to get what we got here. So this show is not quite as long, but part of the reason why we're just kind of throwing this one up quick, because if you've noticed, when this goes up, it hasn't been exactly five days since the last show we posted, and we usually only post them about every five days. But we wanted to put this one up because we wanted to do a special show for Valentine's Day. And no, it's not going to be on the history of Valentine's Day because there's really nothing haunting or creepy about that. I guess if you're thinking about hearts or something and you go into like the actual heart, that could be pretty yuck. So the actual holiday, there's nothing really creepy about it. When I do do the show, I'm going to tell you about another show that you can listen to, though. If that is something that would interest you to know everything you'd want to know about the history of Valentine's Day, I have a show for you to listen to. I'll give you that information with that show. But we are going to focus on our first ever haunted event, and that would be the St. Valentine's Day Massacre that happened up in Chicago, Illinois. Exactly. So that's why I wanted to make sure we had a show to put out on Valentine's, because I wanted to cover that event. And of course, it is haunted. Very, very haunted. And we are very excited because we're actually going to do a haunted tour in Chicago when we do our road trip. And usually when you go to old cities, it's like, okay, this haunted tour, it's about the history and this and that. So Chicago definitely has that. And it has serial killers. And it has gangsters and the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So we're really looking forward to that haunted tour when we travel up that way. So any of you Chicago people, I know we already have one person, Mara, wants to go with us Mm -hmm. from Chicago. So anybody else up there that wants to join us for some hauntings and fun, um, please let us know. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I think the tour that's up there is like Creepy Chicago or something. And that's what they do. They hit all of those because you got... Uh, John Wayne Gacy was from that area as well. So He was way creepy. You know, clowns already freak me out as it is. And then to think that he used to dress up as a clown so he could be close to kids. And I won't even get into what I think we should do to pedophiles. But uh, anyway, they would end up in one of my torture chambers for sure. And then we would have another haunted show. That's true. I don't know if I'd want a pedophile haunting places. Ooh. I know who to sick on him, Victoria from the Ninth Story podcast. Absolutely. Victoria would take care of him in a New York or Ninth Story minute. (laughs) She'd take him to a story of her choosing, and I bet it would be very good for old Gacy. Because as we all know, she tells us that history isn't boring. It's terrifying. terrifying. All right. So we uh, just wanted to apologize that this will be a little bit of a shorter show, but we're going to give you a jam-packed show on the next one, and it's going to come out pretty quickly. So make sure you join us for that, because in order to tell you about the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, we got to get into a little bit of the history about the mob and what led up to that event, because they didn't just happen to go into a building and shoot a bunch of people just for the hell of it. There's a reason why it happened. You know, I was just thinking, we're a little bit demented. We're like... We're going to have Christmas, la, 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 and we're going to tell ghost stories. We're celebrating (laughs) Valentine's Day. It's so romantic, and we're going to tell you about a massacre. (laughs) 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 We might be a little bit non-boring and and terrifying. What does that say about our listeners, though? They're awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Of course, they're. we're all a bunch of creepy people. We love to hang out and be creepy together. So, And if you don't have plans for that evening, we're throwing some steaks on the grill. Come on over. You just invited the whole listenership on our Valentine's date? Sure, we could put a few thousand people in here. Okay. (laughs) Come on down. (laughs) All right. Well, you guys, thanks so much for joining us. We greatly appreciate you listening. You know we love you guys. This has been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This is Victoria from the Ninth Story Podcast. You're listening to the History Ghost Bump Podcast. History isn't boring, it's terrifying. Especially when it goes bump. Boo!